the seminar about uh, green transition uh, of heavy industry uh, and uh, it's nice to see so many people here and uh, we'll have a discussion later on how we can uh, learn from uh, some experiences from Sweden. Uh, my name is Svante Axelsson, I'm a national coordinator for Fossil Free Sweden and I will tell more about that concept later on. But uh, we're happy to start with our climate ambassador, Lars Ramos, uh, to give a perspective on this issue. So please take the floor. Thank you, and welcome to this seminar. Um, I thought I, I should start with the obvious, no? Uh, and that is that climate change compels us to change the way we organize society. Uh, I, as we heard yesterday, for those who listen listening to the high-level segments, nature is not a negotiating partner. You don't negotiate with nature. And unless we start to operate within the planetary boundaries, we are placing our own society at risk. Uh, and future generations at risk. There is of course no law of nature which says that we have to build our societies on, on a foresight-based economy. To the contrary, the, uh, nature is here showing a red flag. The good news is of course that we are in a transition phase. Uh, we are away from the foresight-based economies building a society on renewable energy and in finding solutions uh, for urban planning, agriculture and transport, which can be sustained over time. Though this does not come by itself, we know that there is always inertia. What you have in place is difficult to change. No? You have investment, you have vested interest, and you have livelihoods that you have to take care of. Change is not easy to make, it's not an easy matter. But let me say a few words, and that's what I will focus on, and how this transition fits into the context generally of, of Sweden's economy. I'm fortunate enough to, to represent a prosperous country uh, with a high GDP and with a welfare system in place. And we have achieved this not by some random luck, but I would say an important reason is that we are we are an open economy, open to international competition, and our business and industries are competing on a global market. This has meant that our society has been subject to a permanent structural adjustment. We are in, in a permanent structural adjustment. We move from agriculture, a poor agricultural society, industrial nation, into an IT and knowledge society, and now we are moving into a, a green transition. So in a way, it's not new. The challenges are different, but the basis is the same. Now, that has also meant to embrace this transition, you have to place yourself at a competitive edge. We want to be the first with the latest and not last with the oldest, so to speak. And as I speak for my government and as I speak for my country, I feel free to, to boast a bit. <laughs> uh, and to say that uh, if you look at rankings, Sweden is, is among the very top when it comes to innovative society. We are, I think, if not the first, but the second, it varies from year to year, as the most innovative society in the world. But there is a contract in being open to competition and to exposing yourself to change, which I think is as important. And that is that the whole society would have to come along. Um, and that, that is a contract you find in our labor market between business and, labor and trade unions, but it is also an, a general understanding among uh, the, uh, throughout the political spectrum. And that is that um, while we're not we may not be protecting jobs, we are protecting people. If, if, if companies are being outcompeted, if, if 
different industries cannot survive in a global market, we will make sure that those who lose out are still part of the benefits that comes with the new age, so to speak. So that's the context. I think it's important to put, uh, into, uh, to, uh, to put the, the later presentations into place. My second point would be the importance of forging partnership within our country, of having processes which allows for consultations with various stakeholders. Uh, and we will hear, and, and the Fossil Free uh, Sweden is, is an excellent example of this, of how the business and industries works with the government. And we have also other initiatives that, uh, that will show how we work with the academic world and the business and the, and the government to move ahead. So having that kind of consultations and bringing different stakeholders are important in order to, to ensure continuity and to ensure that whatever changes there are other, in other ways, now this will remain. My final point would be to give the, 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 conclu the concrete manifestation of this is that this year in June my, uh, the Swedish parliament passed uh, uh, a law uh, and uh, passed a bill on the climate policy framework and that bill or that, that, that parliamentary decision also involved establishing a climate law establishing a target of where we are supposed to be in 2045 which is we have set the target of being a zero net of having zero net greenhouse emissions by the latest 2045 um, how are we to get there now that's that remains to be seen but at least we have put some pieces into place uh, in, institutional arrangements <laughs> into place to make sure that, that, that we are moving in that direction. So part of this bill that was passed by Parliament says that every year the government should report back to Parliament on progress being made uh, in moving towards this target. And every new government that comes in, in, into, uh, in after an election, which we hold every fourth year, should have to uh, will have to present a plan on what they are to achieve during their tenure. Uh, so these are uh, a, an element of, of binding governments, future governments, to implementing the laws. We are also establishing an independent uh, climate council to uh, monitor and, and assess what the government is doing and to report on this, and these are public reports, uh, to make sure that there is a critical and scientifically or based assessment of, of, of how government behaves. Um, we will just in a few minutes, once I round off here, hear more about other initiatives I, I, uh, that the government has taken. But let me just mention one example in this year's budget. And that is that uh, the government is, is setting aside some 300 million crowns, which is roughly 30, 30 35 million euro uh, in what is called the industri industry leap. Uh, and that is a contract, you would say, a combined effort by the industry, by the academics and the government to extend, exactly address the issues that we will now, I think, we'll be hearing about. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for that introduction. Uh, and I will follow up now to uh, give you a very briefly uh, presentation of how we work in this uh, initiative. It's coming from the government of Sweden to start up this fossil free uh, initiative. And I am uh, the coordinator of that. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, very uh, Great to be a part of this uh, movement now because we have uh, the Paris uh, in our minds, the, the good feeling from the Paris, uh, and we know also that the message was very clear. Uh, the word need to uh, to uh, limit the an increase of global temperature well below two degrees. So we have a strong challenge in front of us, and Sweden have has taken. Uh, a step further on after Paris, and the, the target is now to reduce our uh, carbon emissions to uh, 85% uh, to 2045. 
Uh, and I think that's possible for us because we have a good history and I will show you that our steps have been rather successful so far. Uh, but if we talk about fossil free Sweden, it's not only me and my staff of three persons. Uh, it's, uh, the, the main work is done uh, of these companies and local communities. Uh, and that's, they are joining every day, new partners is coming into this concept uh, and they're working together to uh, realize the vision that Sweden want to be one of the first fossil free welfare nations. Uh, so they sign up and support that vision and also put all uh, own uh, targets on the table to show that it could be possible. Uh, we're working in a different way with these companies, in different workshops and so on, to, to inspire each other and take further steps. I think one of the most uh, important things in this concept is to uh, support to different branches uh, to develop uh, fossil-free roadmaps for uh, uh, increased competitiveness and employment. And I think this is very important how we, how we uh, talk about this challenge. We will stress the, the discussion how we can increase the competitiveness and employment. And I think that's a key factor uh, in order to, to make real change. Uh, because we, we focus on the benefits. Uh, and that's why it's so important to involve these branches in that process, is that they change their minds. We know from Norway that the, they have an other perspective after that type of process. Because first they look at the obstacles and, and the, the risks, and now they talk more about the, the possibilities. And also be part of the solution. Especially when they know that people, the consumer, want a fossil free products in the future. So if you want to be part of the market, you have to be in the forefront to get money of this process. How we make business uh, in this transition. And now we have the steam industry uh, has, has, has already uh, started this process and we have others. As you see, <coughs> aviation, shipping, uh, chemical industry, different branches and, and they phone us now today. I want also to be part of this process. Uh, and it's very, very good to see that we have this sort of uh, engagement uh, from different parties in Sweden. And uh, they, these reports that they produce, we give to uh, the Prime Minister in Mars next year. Uh, and we got a sort of a puzzle, a Swedish puzzle, what's happening? <laughs> uh, that shows us how Sweden could be a fossil free nation. It's a sort of storytelling that we have these pictures, these stories, uh, gives us uh, great, in, in, yeah, that we can take a step further on, that we can be, be uh, sure that we can manage to do this, to be fossil free. Our three strategies is uh, the storytelling I already mentioned, and I think it's very important to really give people uh, strong pictures, because we are afraid when you're changing. Uh, the change in itself is, is, is something we uh, want to avoid. And that's why it's important to have these pictures, uh, that this society could be much more attractive and more modern than the society we have today. And these pictures is part of our strategy to really produce them. And that many different actors also give stories to the others in the, in the society. The second strategy is to clear the way, to, to reduce obstacles. Because we see that the local communities and companies are more ambitious than the state. And the state is not unambitious, but the local perspective is more ambitious. So my job is to listen to them, uh, what type of obstacles do we have, and I communicate that to different ministers. So I'm running between the companies and the government to solve different problems because the power is coming from the bottom uh, up to the state. And that's very interesting because they see so much synergy effects uh, at the local level. They don't only talk about the climate issue, they talk about noise and, and health problem. And that's why they, they could be more radical uh, compared to the state. The third one is the challenges, uh, and that's a concept to inspire each other to do uh, different concrete actions. And, and the challenges, as we have started now, is to only buy electric cars or, or hybrid cars or cars with biogas, uh, put sun cellars 
on the roof, uh, fossil fuel transport, uh, and the carbon pricing of, of aviation, for example. And this is also very popular, and they sign different part, uh, companies sign up in these different challenges to, to get the movement in the country. Uh, if you're talking about uh, storytelling, I think it's very important to repeat the historical experiences, uh, the success factors, because we're not at the starting point. Uh, and we can see that already have reduced the emissions by 23% and the GMP has increased. And if I show this picture to people in the street, uh, I don't think they uh, associate this with the suffering. Uh, instead, they think it's, it's, it's not a good, uh, good welfare steps we have done during this period. Uh, and they're rather happy about this process so far. Uh, and that's why we have to repeat these successful steps when we take another step. Because we are not at the starting point, as I said. Uh, the electricity sector is already fossil free. Uh, and uh, we have now an agreement in the parliament that uh, we are going to phase out the nuclear power plants. To 2040, we have 100% uh, renewable electric system in Sweden. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. And that's, it's, it's, all, it's all done. It's clear. So then we take the second step. And it's uh, also a rather good step we have already done. 86% of the heat sector is fossil free today. And that's because of we are the first country in the world that introduced the carbon tax system. Uh, and that's why we also see that the demand of the biomass increased when we have these taxes on the fossil energy. So now we are 86% fossil free. So the second step is more or less also fixed. Now we are talking about the transport sector. And it sounds li li rather easy to, to solve this problem nowadays. Uh, in the cities, we have an, an strong investments in public uh, transportation. Uh, we see a new concept of mobilizing people. Uh, mobility concept is increasing. And we don't need to own our own car in the future. It's much cheaper for the households and for the cities and the society as a whole. We can also see a very quick introduction of electric cars. Uh, it's very popular and the price is going down and we see it, it, it sort of shift is coming 2020 or 2025, something like that. The third step is of course the easiest step you can say is to change from fossil fuel to biofuel. And we'll hear more about, more about that later on because we have the forest and we have rest product we can use much more effective that we can shift from fossil fuel to renewables like biodiesel for example. So uh, now we are going further on to the other steps. And uh, as you understand, the subject for this meeting is about these three steps. It's about bio, refineries, the cement production, and the steel production. Uh, and it's very exciting to know that we are in that process already. Uh, if you had asked me for five years ago, I don't think that we have talked about fossil-free steel production in Sweden. But now they are in the process and they are going to show us later on how they will take it step by step. How we can get uh, climate neutral cement and also how we can uh, increase the production of biofuels uh, in the, our biorefineries. So uh, this is uh, the subject for today. And I uh, will finally just show you this picture because I love it. This is, for me, a really good example of transition. Uh, in Oman, it's, it's cheaper to use solar energy than they use their own oil. Uh, and this is the really good news for the world today, that the price on renewables is declining every day, and that's why we have a chance to uh, get under two degrees globally uh, if we are working well together in the whole world. So thank you for this introduction, and now I will give the floor to Jöra, uh, to uh, Morten Gerrup, uh, and talk about the steel production, how it could be fossil free. Please, take the floor.
you very much. Uh, I am uh, Morten Jörndrup. Uh, I'm a metallurgist by uh, training. And uh, since a few weeks back, I'm now the managing director of Hybrid Development AB, which is a company which is co-owned by SSAB, LKAB Vattenfall, which is a steel, mining and energy company. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to say thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. And today I'm going to discuss with you about hybrid. And I would like to start here. Um, we discussed uh, about Sweden's wealth and the country of Sweden, how we developed during the industrial era. And these guys are my predecessors. Uh, it's actually from the 1901 a small blast furnace in the western part of Sweden. And we've come a long way since then. But these are the guys who actually built our wealth, I would say. And um, since then we have been uh, starting to produce high-tech iron ore pellets. We've been doing uh, steel production very efficiently. And further on with the steel products that we are now exporting over the world. And I like to say two things about this. Number one is that steel is a cornerstone in the modern society. We, we have to have it. It's everywhere. I challenge anyone up here to mention one thing that you're using today which has not been influenced by steel in some way before it's, it's reaching your hands. That's one thing you should bear in mind. The other thing is that since these guys started, we have come a long way, and we are now in many of the actual pyrometallurgical operations, we are very close to theoretical minimum. So taking this further and further will be more and more difficult. Uh, and it will only be incremental. This is the steel production globally from 2010 and 2050. As you can see, 2020 it was about 1.4 billion tons of steel produced globally. And the prognosis for 2050 is 2.8 billion tons. And of course, it's the big countries that are growing rapidly will also like to have a share of the welfare. But the good thing is that the share with the green it's actually scrap-based steel production, where you remelt scrap. It's in, in, in a modern society, it's about 70% recirculation. Other, the other 30% are trapped in bridges and you know, long time storage. Uh, the problem is that even though we're increasing the recycle part, the virgin material sector, where you actually start from iron ore, is growing with 40%. And the steel coming from ore is also representing 90% of the CO2 emitted during steel production. So this part, the blue part of the chart, is the problem from a CO2 perspective. So if we do nothing and just carry on as usual globally, we will have a 40% increase in steel production from iron ore and thus 40% increase in CO2 from this sector, which is a bit depressing, <laughs> but <laughs> I would like to look at this instead as being a challenge for us. It is really a challenge for Europe. We need to handle and solve this to start producing the materials we need without any emissions of CO2. We also like to do this maybe to become more independent because as, as of today the, the coke we're using, which is a special type of coal, not the other type of coke that most people think about, uh, is actually imported to more or less 100%. So we actually import carbon into Europe, put it in our furnaces and make CO2 emissions. Another challenge here is how can we do this and make it a business case? for Europe. And the third option is how can we do this and build our know-how and skills. And we think that we have a huge and unique opportunity because within the European Union and in the northern part of, of Sweden actually, 
we have more or less all the building blocks that we need to try this out. We have an abundance of um, fossil free renewable energy. We have an iron ore company producing these iron ore pellets, which actually in iron ore terms is a very high-tech product. I know most people when you think about iron ore it's just a chunk of the mountain, but this has been highly refined. We have the steel production and we have fantastic people. So we think that we can take this and turn this into an opportunity and in our case we have named this opportunity hybrid towards fossil free steel. And hybrid stands for hydrogen breakthrough iron making technology. And the basic principle is to take the renewable energy, produce hydrogen gas, store whenever needed the hydrogen gas, use the hydrogen gas together with iron ore pellets, produce iron and steel and with the byproduct of uh, water vapor. That is the basic concept. So, so <laughs> oh, there, thanks, thanks. Um, so in this case, um, we will actually trade imported carbon, which emits the CO2 with internal resources emitting vapor. So to sum up, this is though not an easy challenge. This transformation will take years. It's a very slow process because we need to do this with business operations being, being viable in the meantime. And it's an extremely broad approach. We're not just covering an isolated industry. We're, we're covering a complete value chain. And as such, we're also covering parts of the society. We think that the technical principles that will be used are, are sound. This has been done. We actually, I just actually yesterday got the, an MMS from one of the researcher in, in Stockholm who had like a 50 gram st steel, steel bit that he had just recently produced. But, yeah, but I didn't fit it into the presentation, sorry. <laughs> it's just this big, so. Um, but even though the technical principles are sound, um, the scale might be a problem. Because a normal steel plant mid-size is at least one million tons per year. Another risk or, or unknown are the future commercial terms. What will it cost to produce as we do today? And what will be the cost when we do this, take this path? But we see it as a major opportunity for Europe but risk minimization is really the key. I can't stress that enough, you know. It's, it's it, because the timing here is, is, we can't tell today. And as you see, the work is ongoing and we are here now. We have three major steps, as we have said now. We've done a pre feasibility study, which we're just summing up. And we're just preparing now for pilot plant studies. Pilot in our world is about one ton per hour in metal in production space. And that we will build, it takes about two years, and then we'll run trials for four years and after that we would like to have a demonstration plant which is more or less a full-size operation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a short question. Can you tell me very briefly this, how did this start, this story? Was it uh, some person in, in a special company or how did this uh, I would say that the driving force originally comes from um, SSAB, the steel producer, and their technical director, who is uh, Dr. Martin Pei, uh, so who eventually, person. yeah, no, it's one person, Dr. Okay. Mark Martin Pei. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he started, you know, thinking forward, I would say, and and uh, he has done an excellent job in promoting this internally and externally, and here we stand today, which is, uh, I'm so happy. Thanks for that, we come back to that discussion later on. And we're happy to have uh, this next speaker here, Carl von Schanz, Landmannen. Please take the floor. Okay, thank you. <coughs> 
Okay, uh, my name is Carl von Schaus. I'm from, uh, from Landmannen. It's a corporation owned by 25,000 Swedish farmers. Uh, we have 10,000 people working in our company. Uh, our turnover is about 4 billion euros. And uh, I'm going to talk about the fuels part. It was very interesting listening to Morten talking about steel. Now we're moving over to fuel, but we're also going to move into biorefineries, as we saw on one of the slides before. Um, Lampen, as I said, 4 billion euros in, in turnover. We have four different sectors. Uh, we have the agriculture sector, which is uh, buying and selling inputs for the grain production in, uh, in the Baltic region, I would say. Uh, we have machinery, we're selling machinery equipment to farmers in different countries. Uh, we have the food sector, uh, which is a global operation. So I would say if you buy, if you need to cross on here in, in Germany, it's about 20% chance it's produced in one of our 15 to 20 factories in, uh, in Europe producing different types of bakery products. And then we have the energy sector, uh, which is the sector I've been heading up now for, for seven years. And uh, I'm going to talk about one of the companies in, uh, in this sector, uh, our biofuels operation in this presentation. Uh, so, uh, the operation we have, it's a company called Lampen and Agroethanol. Uh, it's based in Sweden. Uh, it's a biofuels plant, an ethanol plant, uh, that is, uh, has really uh, developed into a biorefinery. Uh, still very dependent on the, the fuel part, the ethanol part, but increasingly dependent on other types of products that we're producing in this uh, factory. Just to get the, some basics uh, of the operation, inputs, uh, we use grain uh, as inputs, uh, about 600,000 tons. Uh, to put that into perspective, that's 80 truck, trucks with trailers every day coming into our operation. Uh, so it's a massive logistics process getting all that grain into the process. Then we need uh, steam uh, as our main source of energy for, for production. We have a, a good cooperation with E.ON, which has a uh, combined heat and power plant in North Shopping, integrated with a city of North Shopping, that it, they are providing us with uh, CO2 neutral bioenergy for our production. And the outputs that we're getting is, uh, I think it's three main outputs, it's the three top ones here that we get out in similar proportions. Uh, so already here, it's not just fuels, it's other parts as well. So renewable CO2, uh, about 200,000 tons. And uh, a couple of years ago, we developed a joint venture with AGA, which is owned by the Linder Group uh, here from Germany, to liquefy and, um, and to, to clean uh, the, the CO2 that comes out of our operation and turn that into a CO2 product, replacing fossil CO2 products that was sold into the drinks industry in Sweden previously. Uh, the fibers and the proteins of our grain they are uh, being put into animal feed products, so with that, we're replacing one, uh, I would say 25% of the uh, need for imports of soya into the Swedish feed market in that. So we are the biggest <coughs> feed producer in Sweden at the same time. And then of course, ethanol, that we to 95% sell into the fuels market, but there are also other technical applications for, for our ethanol product. And whatever we can't refine in our refinery, our byproducts are then being a raw material into biogas operations. So even our waste streams are being taken care of, turned into biogas and biofertilizers. And also uh, the surplus heat that we're generating in our, in our operation goes back to Eon to the, and then moves on as district heating into the, the city of North Shopping. So that's, that's where we start. Um, and then if we go into the details of our fuel, uh, we have all, always had a uh, strategy that we're going to come up with the best climate performance on the fuel that we are uh, producing. Because we think that biofuels and electric cars, one of the main reasons for those is to reduce the dependency on fossil, uh, fossil fuel in the transportation industry. So. Our strategy has always been to come up with the best climate performance. So our ethanol uh, that comes out of our operations has over 90% 90, 90 greenhouse gas reduction compared to, to petrol. That is uh, 
I would say, world leading. And that's been part of the strategy since the factory was set up in 2000. And we have made additions to that uh, over the time. Uh, I think it's so important to realize that biofuels are not all the same. You can have horrible biofuels that are not producing any climate benefits, and then you can have really good ones. And I think uh, systems and policies that are now being set up in Germany and is now being set up in Sweden, and I think in Holland and the Czech Republic and in California are directing towards climate performance of the biofuels, not the volume of biofuels, because they can all be very different. Uh, what we saw on the previous slide was when we produced an ethanol that we sold to oil companies and they do the blending. We have also taken a step in the value chain and developed our own blend of a, a biofuel product that is ready to so sell to, to customers. So in a joint venture that we have with Scania uh, called ETHA, it's a big demonstration product where Scania is bringing forward 300 trucks and engines that are being able to run on ethanol diesel uh, a product with 95% ethanol, 5% uh, additives, to, and we're providing the fuel, and we're providing uh, the filling stations. And in this scenario, we take our 95% greenhouse gas product, uh, and then we blend it with 5% fossil additives, then that turns into 90% greenhouse gas reduction on the finished product that is now out on the roads. And, and this is something that can be scaled up and uh, support sustainable transport in the heavy duty segment. So that's one of the business developments that we have. And as, we, as you see, I mean, I already mentioned the Linde Group, I mentioned Eon, I mentioned Scania. We do a lot of interaction with, with partners in the industry to, to make things work. Uh, another thing that we have developed over the last couple of years is to complement our raw materials side with food waste. The amount of food waste in uh, Europe and the world is tremendous. I, I mean, the amount of food that we throw away is uh, mind-boggling. And uh, now we are finding a new niche in the food waste industry where we can take bread returns or, or things from stores in plastic bags or packaged in different ways, and we bring that into our system because it's grain-based. And we're removing the plastics, we're doing all the treatments to it, and we bring that into our process. So now, we're taking 30,000 tons of bread waste and use that as raw material. And the, fine, the thing that we do here is we refine it. We take the starch from the bread waste and turn that into ethanol. We take the fibers and proteins, we turn it into feed product. We even make use of the CO2 that comes out of the fer fermentation of those bread waste and turn it into a product that is, that is replacing a fossil uh, CO2 product. And so this is... Uh, another way of a biorefinery addressing the food waste problem uh, of the world in a very interesting way, adding more value than anyone else is adding to that today. But it's not only about fuels, it's a biorefinery producing other parts. I talk, talked about the animal feed products that we produced before. Uh, we are also selling fish feed now into uh, uh, the fish farming market. Uh, you know, helping to complement and reducing f the need of fish meal in, in that industry with a sustainable uh, feed product. We have already today helped reducing the dependency of two fossil based gas products, the CO2 that is now renewable based on uh, grain and also as a raw material supplier into biogas operation replacing the need for natural gas. Uh, this is uh, a, a picture from our plant in North Shopping. We are moving into the paper and packaging industry and finding ways of, of uh, developing uh, renewable barrier material based on the hemicellulosic uh, part of, uh, of uh, the wheat bran or the oat husks, uh, replacing fossil barrier materials in the packaging industry. Uh, biomaterials, today we take the starch from our grain, turn it into an ethanol, we can turn that into polymer and address the, the demands from companies like Lego and Ikea that want to have renewable raw materials in their, in their plastics product and we can be a bioplastic supplier into those areas. Uh, one of the latest uh, areas that we have moved into is food production as well. Uh, the Sweden, Swedish Innovation Agency, Vinova, has awarded us second prize in coming up with you know, the best alternative protein for food consumption and we have developed 
uh, a product that is uh, that we develop in our bio refinery, uh, which has the capability of uh, leveraging the cellulosic part of our raw material that comes in with our current raw material income, uh, the straws, the, the wheat bran and other things. And we have a fungi that we have patented, and that fungi then develops into an edible uh, protein product that is now being able to put it, being put into both the food and the feed industry. And uh, also in this process, uh, the cellulosic material is then turned into ethanol as we can sell as advanced biofuels. So there's, there's tons of things going on in our industry and it's really about being able to refine renewable raw biomass and uh, replacing the dependency on refining fossil raw materials. So that was a brief, uh, thank you, that was a brief Thanks. background to our company. Thanks, Colin. That's a short question. What was the driving forces when you did this investments? I think that uh, the, the, from the initial part was to come up with the best climate performance on the ethanol. And uh, that, uh, we started getting paid for that in 2015. We didn't do that when the policy for climate performance was developed in Germany. Uh, but I think really the, the deep uh, belief that climate performance will be the, the di differentiator in the future, I think that was the key. And then I think all the other things we see, they are all good businesses. So it's just uh, taking av advantage of, of the business opportunities that you see out there. There's and what you say about the discussion, I mean, uh, biofuel is, is rather controversial in Brussels, for example. How is the debate in Sweden uh, when you have this type of concept and use uh, land for biofuels. Yes. I think that when, when people see the breadth of the biorefineries and how we are important suppliers both into the food sector and to the feed sector, I think you get a different <laughs> perspective. I think uh, the debate is based on, you know, you take grain and you turn it into fuel. Fuel is just one of many products that we develop here. And we only take the starch from the grain to do ethanol. The proteins and fibers goes into other types of productions. And, and there's not a starch deficit, it may be a protein defi deficit, but no proteins goes into the fuel chain, it goes into the feed and food chain. Mm. Great, yep. we come back to that later. Okay. Thank you for this. Uh, and now we happen to see Magnus Edin from Sunpine here, also a biorefinery from the forest stress products. So uh, please take the floor. Thank you. Well, hi everyone. My name is Magnus Edin and uh, I have the privilege to represent the company Sunpine. And I'd like to show you we are at one end of the sustainable forestry. This is our company. This is the, our biorefinery based in Piteå in the northern part of Sweden. We like to speak ourselves that we are uh, using the Swedish oil reserve, that is the forest. And this is actually the company of Sunpine in the year 2006. And then the development went really quick and the owners believed in the company. So four years later, a full biorefinery was inaugurated here in the northern city of Piteå in, in, uh, in Sweden. And then there was a, and the creation behind it, there is a founder, an entrepreneur, a, a really a natural force of a person. But there is also this, the government was at the time having, having some long-term ideas that we need green diesel for the future. And in Sweden we have a history of using different taxes to punish what we want not to have and to promote what we want to have. And now we are going back, some, some of the countries don't really appreciate this and now we are actually abandoning that and going for a quota system, demanding the oil companies to have reductions. So we are leaving that but we still have an incentive, and that was one of the carrots that created the, the, the company. And in 2013, the company was actually up and running, and we were making profit. The raw material is called crude tulloil from sulfate pulp, pulp mills, and we produced crude tal diesel and bee oil. But then, sustainable innovations, they feed other sustainable innovations. So only three years later, we have a full-scale biorefinery. We have two types of raw material and we have four products. And this is actually based on the sustainable forestry. We are in the end of the, of the value chain. 
And I'd like, just like to make an example, and I've been counting the chairs here. <laughs> this chair is the amount of forest, the volume of forest in Sweden nine, for 100 years ago. One chair. 100 years later, we have two chairs. We have doubled the volume of the forest. And the fantastic aspect of this, during those 100 years, we have used four chairs. We have been able to use four chairs while doubling the amount of forest in the country. And then those four chairs, though are coming from kitchen, doors, furniture, houses, and then some of the streams are going to the pulp mill, and then the stream continues and it ends up, we have a 2% residual product from the pulp mill. It ends up with us, we are a biorefinery, it's the Tal Diesel, the Rosin goes to paintings, to glue, inks, even the white markings on the road. The bio oil is still mainly for energy, and the turpentine, <coughs> a horrible, smelly chemical that actually ends up in the fragrance industry. Perfumes, fantastic. And all of this is coming from the basis of our country, uh, sorry, of our company. The basis of our is the sustainability behind it. And we have even developed one more step. So we are, no, not, we are no longer depending on fossil fuel for energy in our own company. We are using our own bio oil now. And this is actually a development during this year. So it's continuously sustainable innovations are feeding new sustainable innovations. And we have a unique facility, especially when we compare with others the combination of raw material and, and, and the products, the need for energy, and actually, in a comparable view, quite a reasonable small investment. Sales is more than a billion. We are only 53 employees, but we have created more than 100 jobs because we are heavily depending on others. We have a dream team as the owners. You have the forest from Svea Skog and Södra, you have the oil industry from Prim, you have the entrepreneur, and now we have the chemical industry taking also the, the, the rosin. So everybody is involved, and there might be different aspects from time to time, but I have, during my soon five years, I have only had unanimous decisions in the boardroom when it comes to decision. And the proudness of our company, 100,000 cubic meters of Tal diesel annually, reduces the emissions of CO2 with 250,000 metric tons every year. We do it every year. Thank you very much. And uh, the question for you is, is of course, is it Lars Stigson who is the yes. entrepreneur? Who... Lars is the innovator and the entrepreneur. And uh, how did he start this with, uh, has, he, has he money himself? Or... Uh, he has been an entrepreneur for many years linked to the forest industry. And I think there were three drivers. Lars saw this incentive from the government and an opportunity as an entrepreneur. And he's also really breathing to do something more for the forestry. I think Svea Skog and Södra, they saw a possibility for another diversity from the forest. And then Prim, they are actually a, an oil company who believes in the, in the vision for our government that in 2030 we will have 3.5 million cubic meters of renewable fuels. And if they still want to sell fuel, they want to have a large portion of those 3.5 million. So they were a little bit hindsight. They looked into the future. So I think three maybe, and they met. Yes. And they took a risk. Mm -hmm. Yes, we come back to that also later on. Thank you very much so far. Uh, and now we have time for the last speaker, Philip Johnson from uh, Chalmers University. Yes. And you talk about the climate neutral cement. Yeah, and a little more less. Bit, uh, more or less. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is this the right one? Yeah. So I'm Philip Johnson, I'm from Charles University of Technology, which is in Göteborg, Sweden here. It's the Göteborg is the capital of Sweden. <laughs> no, it's not, I just joke. Um, the second biggest city in Sweden. Uh, so yeah, what we've talked about here today are these very energy intensive industry and 
how can we transform this industry? And I will give some reflections on how one can think around this and, and some results that we have uh, obtained. So I think first we can conclude two things. One is, of course, that the cost to mitigate climate change is small compared to the sort of entire value creation in society. It, if you remember, it was shown, for instance, in the Stern report. So then one can, of course, ask oneself, why doesn't it happen then? And I'll come back to that. The second thing is uh, that it's a fact, it's obvious, that if the world would move towards an agreement with the Paris Agreement or, or limit uh, warming to, to two degrees centigrade or so well below that, it's a fact that there will be an immense demand for carbon neutral products and services. That is simply a fact. So, so the risk here that we are sort of playing with to be a forerunner for countries or companies is of course that the world does not move in that direction. But then of course we will be all be losers, so it's not really an alternative. So, but we still have to manage this risk if we, these very nice examples that were shown uh, will come about at, at a very large scale. So then the key issue here is to really look uh, in line with, for instance, the, the Steel Initiative presented here, to look at a cross-sectoral approach. Because we have different, this is cement, so we have production of cement where most of the emissions along this particular value chains to end products, uh, most emissions are generated at the production. And then we have different, these different ways of using cement in concrete, in buildings and so on. And there the tradition, the willingness to pay different policy instruments are very different. So it is a trick there how we can address this issue of limiting and, and implementing the required technologies along this value chain. So if you here have uh, cement and there you have steel and then of course in Sweden and other countries of course they go basically to these three very important but carbon emitting sectors. So in buildings, in transport infrastructure, and in, of course in the transport systems themselves. And uh, therefore, uh, we have really to closely look here into these different sectors with respect to what are the mitigation options, what are the willingness to pay for this. And if we take uh, cement first as an example, if we make the necessary steps, because it's technically well known how to reduce emissions to near zero or to zero. If we do that, well, we will face one obvious problem, not the technical problem, but the problem that the cement, the price of cement will increase with some 70%. And if cement tomorrow goes to the government and tells them, well, we need, it, Philip Johnson has told me that it costs 100 euro per ton to remove uh, these carbon emissions from the cement industry, ah, then, the Minister of Environment says, okay, we just in included tax of 100 euro per ton of CO2. The cement industry will go crazy and say we'll go bankrupt. So that's not really possible at the moment. You can also think of that these industries are typically under the EVTS, the uh, trading scheme of Europe, which is a very good system, I think. The problem with that system, it's good in principle, but the problem is that the price for an emission allowance has for a long time been below 10 euros per ton and most likely it will remain at yeah maybe a little bit more so it's it's fine perhaps for incremental uh, transformation of this systems and processes but here we need transformative technologies for instance in this case of cement we most likely would need carbon capture and storage which involves very high upfront <coughs> investments the same reasoning we can do with steel which is a material that is more actually uh, uh, imposed to, to global competition. Cement is a little bit more regional in terms of, of competition. So that if we impose this, not the technology that Morton presented, which is, has the potential to, to be more cost efficient, this involves CCS as well, but other measures as well, 
the steel price will, will increase at about 25% if we make this 100 euro, because it's a roughly the same here cost to, to reduce emissions to zero. So that's a tremendous problem. It won't happen under the EU ETS, I can guarantee you that. Although I'm the first to defend that system. So, how should we think about that? Well, if you remember this value chain, this supply chain, if we instead take these measures of 100 euro per ton, we implement them and we calculate how much would that cost to the end product, then we get this. And, we, and if you remember the Stone Report, this is just a, perhaps a more concrete example to show that. Well, a building made of that will be less than 0.5% more expensive, and a steel, a car made of CO2 free steel will le be less than 0.5% more expensive. And the point is not exactly these 0.5%, because you can actually do a lot of, here we have calculated different buildings, but with sort of more or less traditional building uh, methodologies, but there is a lot of other efforts you can do with light constructions and, and other measures, so it could as well be minus 2%. And if you now go back to this competitiveness of companies and why one should be a forerunner, if we can find a regime that we actually pay this little sum of money, I'm sure, and I, there are already sectors where you go and buy a consumer product, I mean maybe you go and buy some fair trade banana and so on, a lot of people are already prepared to pay a bit more of that. But if there were two Volvo cars next to each other, and one was made of CO2 free steel, we assume they are electric, and the other was not, and the CO2 free steel car was a fraction of a percent more expensive, I'm sure there would be a lot of people who would be willing to pay for such a car. So here we really need some heavy thinking about finding new regimes of pricing emissions. I think we already see in some, along some supply chain, if you go to IKEA, for instance, almost all marketing is related to sustainability. Not because I think of the customers as been running there and asking what uh, the bookshelf bill is, how much CO2 impact it has, but I think because it's really most companies and realize we have to be a forerunner here. So I think this is an immense possibility uh, for making this to happen. And we are now in a new project looking at the various way to establish this uh, fund that is required to make the non-incremental things happening to finance by maybe some sort of green fund these uh, in investments that are required in this upfront, in the beginning of the value chain, these processes where the real investments are, the, the heavy investments, in order to find uh, then in some years later that uh, we can produce these uh, end products and services at a very moderate cost increase in spite of having reduced emissions to zero. So it's a piece of cake. If you do it right. Thank you, Philip. And I think we'll now uh, invite all speakers up to this panel discussion. Morten, Carl, Magnus, and Philip. And Lars, of course. So, um, and I invite you, of course, if you can have some questions. Um, it's interesting to listen to you all, uh, and uh, we are in a situation that we are taking really big steps uh, to be fossil free. And we have talked about the electricity sector, heat sector, and transport sector, and now we are taking other more difficult sectors. Uh, and the, the subject and uh, the, the, the debate today is how we get business from this transition. Uh, and my question is. Do markets themselves solve this problem? Or what, what type of role does the state need to have in this process? Uh, so we have talked about the, the opportunities and the good story. Now I will look for the little bit obstacles and, and uh, what type of cooperation we need between the companies and the state or EU regulation. So, uh, anybody start? Paul. Yeah, uh, if you talk about uh, the biorefineries and the different products that we get out of there, uh, it has originated from the biofuels industry and uh, providing sustainable fuels into the transport sector. And I think that the transport sector and having the right policies and incentives uh, on the, from a political base there, it, that's extremely important to be able to develop these biorefineries that originates from the biofuels industry. If policies would uh, go against grain-based, biofuels or, or biofuels in general, 
uh, I think the development and opportunities that we see in biorefineries will diminish quickly. So it's extremely important to have good, solid policy in the fuel space uh, for now. If biofuels will be out-competed uh, in 30 years from now, we're gonna be fine. We're gonna have generated so much value from the proteins and fibers and the gases and, and everything else. So, uh, and, and we can turn our starches into biomaterials or bioplastics over time. Uh, but uh, for now, it's extremely important to have strong uh, policies on, on transport and, and biofuels. Are you afraid about this discussion now in Brussels and so on, or do you think we can have a more uh, yeah. good discussion I, I, of I, bad I, and good? Yes, no, I'm, I'm extremely uh, scared uh, about the development right now in the Renewable Energy Directive that, that is to update here, because that can really destroy the development that we, that we see in front of us. Uh, we, we're starting to make a lot of money in uh, the feed sector, in the gas sector, in, in other sectors. The recycling sector is extremely interesting. Uh, but uh, if we can't develop our base business of uh, biofuels based on grain for you know, the coming 15, 20 years or something like that, uh, it's going to be very, very, very difficult. So it's important to have good policy in that respect. Mm -hmm. Minus, we have the same uh, feeling. Yeah, I, I, I feel a worry, yes, and, and uh, just a short reminder that uh, we, we are looking into phasing out fossil fuels and we have been pumping up the raw material from the ground, relatively easy, and it's an industry who had had 100 years to make the refineries perfect. So the green op alternatives, they are not saving cost yet. So the society needs to say we need the green fuels. And the long-term aspect is exactly what Carl said, but there are two more aspects. Do not point at a certain product and do not interfere with a certain raw material. Make the regulation. You want to achieve a climate effect. Make strong demands on the climate effect and there are more innovators and entrepreneurs who will answer to that. But when, uh, if, the, if the political side starts to interfere with it, you can only use this raw material for this, and you can only buy that product for that, then we are on the wrong track. Because then we will only stop the, de the development in, 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 the, in Sweden and in the world. But I, I do support that the long term, because we also want investments. And investments, you think in long term. And our company is sometimes used as a fact that it, it went so quickly. But it still it took seven or eight years be before we were fully up and running. But you understand the discussion about uh, bad or good biofuels. Do, do we need more uh, strong uh, definition of what sustainable uh, biofuel is? Uh, I think that the transparency and, and, and to, and to um, really um, sort of liberate the consumer power, show the transparency and focus on this well-to-wheel, not just life cycle analysis. Show well-to-wheel and the full climate effect, and then people will decide. We will choose, but do not point... But do you think market themselves choose, or do we need regulation? Uh, not, the regulation at the moment is still needed, because at the moment we are efficient, I think, but still the fossil alternative is cheaper. So there needs to be some kind of regulation. Sweden has a history of tax exem uh, exemptions, uh, at the, but now we are switching to a um, quota system and then uh, it's just a debate on where is the level of the quota system. But even in the quota system, don't focus on volume, focus on the climate effect. Philip, uh, we heard uh, Lars mention that Sweden is an open economy. Uh, is it possible to, to do this really big shift, transition in the open economy? I, I think the, the key issue here is to, to, to price emissions, but in, in new ways. And, uh, and I think that the role of the government, as you were asking for, I think it's rather than maybe subsidize various uh, efforts, it would be to find ways to minimize the risk for those investors who want to be forerunners. Uh, may, maybe establishing some, some green fund or something, and then lending out money from government to make it possible to make the upfront investment uh, at an earlier stage before these uh, half percent money has been regained. Uh, so I think that uh, from the market. So I think that is very, very important. And I think that also what you said, it's extremely important to find a way to price the emissions because 
you said that it maybe the, the when the oil price is, is lower, they can compete. But I mean, uh, uh, we want the price to go to zero because we don't want to go to phase out. So there's a, 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 it's sort of a catch-22 situation there. So therefore, we need new ways to price emissions and to, to limit the risk of the companies. But of course, I think it's possible uh, in, in, an, in an open economy, absolutely. But do you think uh, the price will be correct? I mean, we're talking about polluted papers have been for many years now, and it's still very low price on the emissions. Is, is that way yeah, practical? Well, my, practical my, or yeah, yeah. my point is that this EVTS system and a carbon tax Will, will will never have the transformative effect because if it really hits a sector, there will be an exemption because the, there will be loss of yeah. jobs and so on. So I think instead one should be promoting the technical development and establishing these new, not very high, more costly or even cheaper renewable or low uh, carbon products mm. uh, in that way instead because otherwise, um, yeah, it would be, be, be impossible to get this happening. I think, the, I think the EVTS is important as it sends out, sends out a very clear signal that we need to reduce emissions and it will put some sort of floor uh, price and so on, but it will not uh, 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 give these transformative changes along the supply chains like cement, iron and steel and for instance uh, in fuel production where we need these also high biofuel production high investments in big thermal uh, conversion units. And your concept is that state don't need to put their state money in the, this uh, production. Uh, they can construct sort of policy agreements that the risk will go down. Yeah, I mean, I th given that it's, it, it, if, if it comes about, it's a very, very little uh, addition to the consumer price uh, or, or the price for those who procure different uh, products in, in, along the value chain. I think it's more about limiting the risk for companies like SSRB or, or Agroethanol and East when they want to invest in, in such units and then uh, maybe lending out this money and then that there is a regime that maybe a voluntary regime among sort of progressive companies who want to be forerunners to themselves uh, arrange for a way to pay through the products for, for these investments. But the problem is then that that if you start some establish such a fund that you for each project you, you collect a little bit fraction of a percent money that goes into sort of a, a fund that will later uh, uh, pay for building such a demonstration plant or a real plant, it will take too long. So there, I think, is where the government should come in and and okay, if you establish this regime, we will lend out money to you to uh, to make the possibly upfront investment at an earlier stage. That, I think, would be a more, more sensible way to do it. Lars uh, Macron is talking about more tax adjustments. Do we need that type of uh, regulation to make this happen, to make this big transition? Well, let me first say that uh, I think that uh, the business uh, has already demonstrated that we can do a lot themselves uh, but where there is a need for regulation and uh, especially to establish a fair level playing field so that, that a, green, a green approach is not disadvantaged I think we should certainly be open for that but I was intrigued by, 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 by the professors here Chalmers uh, presentation saying that to address the emissions in the cement industry now, it, what comes out in the bi uh, in the final product mm. is, is is only a marginal a cost increase. Now. Mm. So how could you possibly find a way where that that major cost mm. at one level in the chain mm. can be absorbed at the different levels? Mm. But I think it's we, we have seen that now that that consumers are ready mm. to take on uh, now an additional cost if they know that it's a good choice for the climate. We've seen this in consumer goods now. So it should be able for the industry working through these levels to, to address it. But, but now how to go about, I leave that to others. <laughs> I can just mention very, very briefly that the, uh, the, along this value chain of, from, from cement industry to uh, buildings and infrastructure has been, uh, uh, they've got, also got intrigued, but it's the, the 
there's an initiative called the Concrete Initiative, so uh, I'm looking forward to that, and, and they really want to make a change. Morten, do you need, uh, do you do this yourself, or do you need money, or uh, regulations, uh, or something else? No, we need both, I would say. Both? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I would say that in the long run, of course, this would be a viable business case for us, but the transition as such uh, will be complicated. And, and uh, there is direct transitional costs associated with the transition itself, which needs to be you know, some kind of risk sharing we would appreciate, especially in the early cases as we are in. That is one part. But then when you come to the later stages, when you, you're about to approach the market, we need something enhancing the pull effects because if, if, of course, if you make a car and you use steel and it only affects the, the end price of the product 0.5%, it's, it's an easy case, I would say. But if you're somewhere along that value chain and you're doing this mechanical bracket and you buy steel plate and you sell steel plate bracket, a workshop somewhere in, I don't know, small land to pick a Swedish place. Um, of course, for him, the percentage in, in the price increase would be tremendous. So there needs to be a pull there from his, his clients. But you think the market would pay in the long end? Yes, I think so. I think so. Yeah. So, so it's a sort of bridge? Yes, we, mean, we need a bridging to, 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 for the actual transition. Yes. Yeah. And Philip, to talk about uh, not paying uh, concrete money out from the state, can you uh, develop that thought, how we can develop uh, policies and regulations that minimize the risks for, for investors, what could it be? Is it public procurement? Or I would say that, that it depends on where, in what phase you are in the transition. We are still at the very in early phase. In your phase. We are, very, we, <laughs> we are at the very early phase, I would say, and we're just about to start pilot research, which is still, to some extent, quite fundamental. Uh, but the support could, of course, come in, in, in direct funding, but it could also come in support where you build capacity and, and know-how in society. Which, because we need to be certain that what we are doing is as low risk as possible. May, may I just, but, sorry, may yeah. I just comment uh, that uh, by no means do not mean that for early technology development and demonstration that will always, I think, need direct yeah. governmental support. What I mean is, is what we're very good, I mean, not very good at, but we're at least recently in society in Europe and, and Sweden and elsewhere, fairly good at this to establish this demonstration mm -hmm. project and of course research. Mm -hmm. It's after that, that to me. But exactly, when you want it to really take off, mm -hmm. that's where we have, have problems. Then I also want to comment that, of course, uh, the whole challenge with this supply chain sort of pricing is that we, in a transparent way, must act uh, allocate that little extra price to the end product because otherwise, exactly as you say, there will be, of course, along this value chain, there will be a fierce competition. Maybe some of the, those making, I don't know, brakes for Volvo or something. I mean, that, that they are, have a very, very little margin. So I think that's the trick. That exactly when you go, as you go and buy a, a fair trade a, a banana or something, it's, it's sort of clear that there is an extra. At least we think so as consumers, and we're willing to pay that. So that's a very important. So it's a very important point. But you think that public procurement could be a, a strong driving yeah, force? Yes, I mean in Sweden we have, for instance, the Swedish Road Authority, and they have also, uh, they also have these uh, uh, targets, of course, we are in line, obviously, with the, with the Swedish targets. And of course they have a procurement budget of, I think it's, uh, it will be 65 billion euros over a 12-year period or so on. So of course such will have also a very important role to play. Um, but uh, I, the, the problem with procurement could be that traffic, the Swedish Royal Authorities say, okay, the year 2030, we will only buy carbon-free cement, mm -hmm. they would say. But the problem with that is, uh, uh, is that it's, it, it's not enough for, for, I think, for the cement industry mm -hmm. to invest 2 billion euros or something in a, whatever it is, CCS and other But measures. the Germans say the same. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, so I, I think that uh, because when, when, when you reach, if they make these investments, and maybe the conditions have changed or, or something has happened, and so, so it's too high, still too high risk, therefore I think it's needed some sort of other uh, way to, to minimize or reduce the risk. Hmm. Okay, we open up the discussion. Questions, please. Uh, you are need a microphone. Right. Okay, better to have a yes. microphone. 
Okay, I am Vishnika Kasic, coming from Croatia, from the Ministry of Environment and Energy. So first I would like to know uh, what uh, interfere with uh, stakeholders uh, uh, was needed before uh, passing uh, this bill through the Parliament and at first through the government. And uh, then I would like to know how you resolve uh, related to the production of biofuels because uh, you, uh, the raw material is grain and uh, so how you avoid uh, competition with the food uh, also and meet these requirements towards to iron directive because you have to have this requirement for the uh, uh, sustainability of mm -hmm. the and the first question was it a bill about this climate? Yes, uh, well, well, what is needed because you know sometimes um, uh, uh, stakeholders they okay. they are ready or or, or it, it, this is very far looking uh, bill. Thank you for that. Stop the loss. Yeah. Um, before the government uh, presented the bill to Parliament, they established a, a commission um, uh, on this topic and on the. Uh, with quite a broad mandate now. And in that commission sat uh, representatives for the political parties uh, in Parliament, but all the, also other stakeholders like civil society, uh, business, and, and experts now. And so there was a broad group of, of stakeholders involved in, the lead, in, in, in that commission. At the fi final stages, it, it was for the political parties now to agree. But based on the Commission's report, the government then prepared a bill. So it has, so to speak, already been in, in, the, in the bag before it got into the wax sack. <laughs> no, uh, so it was grounded before it went to the Parliament. Do, do you have an English? Yeah, yes, we have an English presentation of this, uh, if you would like to have it. Yes. So are you going to do the, the same? Uh, because uh, now we, um, uh, we will prepare our kind of law, so I would like to... Okay. You I have it. You just copy it. I have it yeah. back there at the end of the room. You can take it. At the back of the room, so thank you. The conflict between uh, food and uh, biofuels. Yes. How do you handle that? Yeah. Um, well, First of all, I think there's been a lot of reports from uh, United Nations and, and different organizations uh, decoupling the, you know, they, they more talk about food and fuel rather than food versus fuel. Uh, so I think um, there's, um, there, there's more and more evidence that there's not a link. If you look at food prices and the amount of biofuels production, okay. If you look at food prices and uh, biofuels production, they are not coupled or correlated going in the, in the same direction. So I think there's a lot of evidence that it's more food and fuel rather than food versus fuel. But then if you would say that there still is uh, a correlation between food and fuel, uh, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of things to, to look at. If you look at the, the, the amount of land set aside, fallow land in Sweden, uh, that has increased tremendously over the last 50 years. Uh, there's more land set aside because we don't need it. We can't find uh, a good use for it. And uh, since we're owned by 27, 25,000 Swedish farmers, uh, they want to have production on their lands that they own. And when they saw that food production in Sweden, we're importing more and more food from other places, feed for animals at farms in Sweden are decreasing, they wanted to find a new opportunity and they saw biofuels as an opportunity to have more jobs and, and more being able to use the land that was just being put aside. So I think that is important to look at. I think one of the th things that we have to work on, I think you spent time in, the, in Malawi where one of my colleagues was in, in Africa, that the productivity and the yields on their lands there, even though, I mean, the natural circumstances are such that they would be able to produced at a very much higher productivity and yield. So there's a lot of potential in farming across the, the globe to increase yields, to have more grain, more, more food products from, our, uh, from the land that is already used, uh, but not in a very productive way. And then if you come into the biorefineries and, and the biofuels operation that we have, as I said before, we're, we're using the starch of, uh, of the grain to turn into ethanol. We're not using the proteins and fibers. Those proteins and fibers are going into the food chain. So I think we're, 
we're adding uh, more protein and feed uh, being produced in Sweden or in Europe and reducing our dependency on getting those protein products from, from other places around the world. So I think it's, uh, there's a lot of things talking for that we should view it as food and fuel. Uh, and even I think we need to have a be uh, have a good understanding of I look as well in direct land land use change and and uh, get to grips with that in a, in a good way. But I don't think that will change the fundamentals that it will still be food um, and and fuel rather than food versus fuel. What do you say about the meat production? I mean, uh, I think fifty five percent of all land in our planet is used to feed animals. Uh, do you think the meat production will go down and give us more land to biofuels? Well, with, with uh, increasing richness in, uh, in third world countries, I think probably demand for protein and, and meat will go up uh, on, on a scale. And I think it's important to come with sustainable uh, feed products for animal production. And then you need to have a sustainable animal production as well. And, and, uh, and I think there are some good examples of that. And, and, and I think that as in the same way as you produce fuel, you can produce fuel in a sustainable way. You can also produce meat in, in, a, in a more sustainable way than other examples out there. So. And then it will be more expensive. And the, price, and the consumer will go down. I don't know. I, I don't <laughs> think we, we're not going to produce some more expensive uh, feed products. So. Yeah. Oh, many questions here. First you. Short answers. Ulla Weyer, I'm from the Bologna Foundation, we're a Norwegian-European uh, NGO. Um, my question to, to Clement and Marcel Lars about, uh, about CCS, since we've heard that it's, it's uh, already uh, going to be a small uh, cost increase for the final, for the final products. Uh, but you will must need somewhere to store the CO2 that you, that you capture. And, um, if you're not going to store it in uh, in Sweden, uh, I might offer on behalf of my country that there's plenty of, of storage space in uh, in Norway. I mean, the question is, will you um, make CCS? Uh, will Sweden make CCS a part of its uh, of its uh, climate plan? Um, and will, if so, will you spend some time and resources also on talking to your Norwegian colleagues? Because I I know that they are uh, sort of looking for signals from from Europe. They're a bit, mm -hmm. they're, they're quite modest uh, as we as we are in Norway. So they're they're not really uh, sure that that someone yeah. will actually be able to use the storage space available in uh, in Norway. Okay, we'll take all questions now because we have a lack of time. Hi, I'm Natalie Bennett. I'm here with the Green Green Economics Institute. Uh, but uh, for full transparency, I used to be leader of the Green Party of England and Wales. My question, first of all, to Mr. Johnson is, you said if we do it right, we can get the zero carbon cement, is that, etc. Is that just a case of getting the carbon price right, or do we need an entirely different system? And then a general question to all of you, perhaps particularly addressing uh, Mr. Van Schantz about, um, you talked about bioplastics. And you know, there's sometimes a feeling like bioplastics much better because they're made from organic things, but actually you know, they can end up polluting the oceans, being as much a bigger problem as uh, those based on petroleum. Uh, so a question really for all of you, but particularly starting from that point, do you think about sustainable development goals? Because as I think we're hearing a lot here and some of the questions are referred to, they actually carbon emissions are only part of our many problems. And the SDGs actually, you know, really give you the answer for how we create a sustainable planet. So is that something that your companies are really thinking about, SDGs? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next question. Oh, same question, okay. Down there. Hello, my name is Niklas Clement. I'm a volunteer with German NGO German Watch. And my question is, I really appreciate the innovative technologies you provided yet. Uh, what is pretty remarkable about your emissions target is that it is only net zero emissions and as Sweden is, as a European country basically really import dependent regarding some high emission technology. Probably if you just look at consumption emissions even in 2050 Sweden will just as simply still have a lot of emissions and a lot of the technology you touched are not applicable on a global level like for example bioenergy on a global scale has got not yet developed far enough, so I wonder if there's a strategy long term to really get to a zero emissions a consumption base as well as production base. Thank you for that. Uh, we start with the signals to Norway. Can we give some signals? 
No, happy to send a comment there. So, no, but I think they are. Um, I think there is there are plans from away, and of course, uh, uh, a good thing with uh, starting uh, a carbon capture and storage. Uh, for instance, for the cement industry, is that you can start by transporting by ship. So you don't need to establish the pipeline infrastructure in the beginning. So that will, I think it's uh, really looked at to to send it to. Uh, to the storage because the, the greater storage cap capacity is in an old sea, so they absolutely cost about 15 euro per ton. Uh, 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 we have also question about new uh, strategies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure I, I, I understood the question, but I mean, what I'm, my my point is that I, I I think for these transformative transformations in steel industry and and cement industry, for instance, and also other large processes high upfront investments, the EU ETS is not the right policy measure. That was my point. You need to find something else, uh, most likely driven from consumer side, maybe with some risk minimization from the government to in interfere and help. And you haven't mentioned the green bounds, for example. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's one good thing. One absolutely. Concrete. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Example. Uh, and then we maybe have... Maybe I could just comment that. I mean, to Sweden, obviously Sweden is sort of thinking we are really forerunners and so on, and, and I think it's therefore very important that we, 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 we are forerunners and then hopefully that technology can spread to other countries that, that if it will be sort of in fashion or buy a carbon free cement when it's available of course, I'm sure that as for the electric car it's spread to China and solar panels spread to China for instance. So, because now it's of course if we, if we calculate our production based emissions they are like five, six uh, not euro, uh, tons per capita but if we take cons consumption, it's, I don't know, 11, 12 or something. So of course we have, a, and that's the reason I think for the whole that we need to, to be for it. We have a Nordic uh, community. Uh, do you think Sweden will invite Norwegian in this issue? Sweden and Norway, we always collaborate closely. And it was in the papers just recently that Norway will buy a lot of renewable winds for the aluminium plant. So this may be another example. And I think on the storage, I, we need to be responsive to what the industry needs. And then if the industry comes to the governments and say, no, this must be part of the solution, we would certainly listen to it. Uh, and, and if I may also answer to the, yeah. uh, to the green, uh, the, yeah. I think you have a very good point there. Uh, of course, no? uh, uh, the, 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 cop the target we have set is what the country or the territory Sweden emit. You know? And then you have the whole issue of our con uh, cons uh, how our pattern as consumers. You know? But there we rely on civil society, we rely on the political parties and others to mobilize that ch change of attitude. I don't think we would like to have any government to you know, impose on people saying you should behave like this. You know? uh, but government must be, of course, responsive to the cause of society. But do you think we get a, a CO2 emission target on the con from the consumer perspective in the long run? Um, that's everyone's guess, no. <laughs> Say yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I mean, I guess the point is that there will be, I mean, in, hopefully in 10 years' time, nobody wants to buy a, a carbon emitting product. And there is already now a lot of companies along value chains that are really concerned about their carbon footprint. So for instance, when IKEA go to Schenker to ask for transportation services, uh, they, they go to Scania or Volvo and ask, what if we buy a truck for you, what are they? So I think the, you have to look at the whole chain. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, certainly there is a government responsibility, but there is also an individual responsibility, certainly. The last question. Organic Yes, I, I uh, address folks on the, the bioplastic questions from from you, from the UK. And uh, just to a bit of a disclaimer here, uh, we have moved into biofuels, we have moved into gas products, we have moved into feed products, we have moved into food products, uh, we have moved into certain areas, but we haven't yet moved into bioplastic. So if I'm not 100% correct in my response, I apologize. But my thinking is like this. Uh, there are two areas that I showed where we're looking to replace plastic products. It's one in the, the bioplastics, uh, for instance, supplying into Lego or I IKEA into to furniture and, and areas there. And there I think we will not create a biodegradable bioplastic uh, for a furniture or for a Lego or something like that. We would move into, so we would have the same problem as you mentioned for uh, plastics 
based on uh, fossil materials. So that has to be re addressed through recycling uh, policies and, and things like that to address that. We're not going to be able to help in that respect. Uh, on the packet, paper and packaging side, uh, where we, for um, milk packages that has fossil plastic uh, barrier materials, we can replace those fossil plastic barrier materials with, uh, as I said, uh, a silen uh, material that comes from the hemicellulosic part of wheat bran or oat husks. And that is biodegradable, so one of the reasons that you now don't throw your milk packages in uh, recycling things, you throw them in your normal trash, it, because you have those plastic parts in it. So that uh, biorefineries can, can support and find barrier materials. So you can throw the whole milk package in, uh, in a recycling bin. Yes, the time is out. Uh, have you some short question, uh, comments? Oh, maybe again, coming to the plastic bags again, we, we should not focus too much on the products itself because it's not a plastic bag. And even if it's a bioplastic bag, if it's in the stomach of a whale, it's still the same issue. And in my community, we are burning all the waste, including the plastic bags. So it comes back, having the regulation, what, what do we want to achieve? We don't want the bags in the ocean. So that's one regulatory. So sometimes we focus too much on the product. We want to focus on the regulatory framework that addresses what, where we want to go. Thanks for that, uh, thanks for coming, and a big hand to the speakers and the great panel.